not be able to stay home, brother. You will not be able to plug in, turn on, and cop out. You will not be able to lose yourself on stag and skip out for beer during commercials because the revolution will not be televised. The revolution will not be televised. The revolution will not be brought to you by Xerox in four parts without commercial interruption. The revolution will not show the newspapers. Most of the newspapers, the mainstream newspapers, are owned by concerns that are close to the to the party in power, and uh, and so they they will instruct their newspaper. Okay, during election time, be kind to the Barisan National because the Barisan National is the uh, only good government, good ruling party that we have now. We don't want the DAP or the other parties to form the government. And so we all, including the Sun, we were kinder to the Pakistan National. Always, in fact, in fact, this is a stance adopted by all newspapers during the run-up to the election. From the day the the what you call the dissolution of Parliament uh, was announced until the until the day until polling day, we behave like that. So during those days. I mean, you cannot say that the newspapers are ethical, but we want to be ethical. So how how do you have an ethical media with this kind of thing? Ownership. How can you have an ethical newspaper? Ownership. Because the owners, like in Malaysia, yes, they dictate the content. But elsewhere, they are newspapers owned by certain, certain uh, commercial interests, but they do not interfere. And there's always a fight. And they, and, and, and they fought. Many newspapers, the editors fought back if they received induction from the <coughs> owners. But of course, usually it's uh, not very successful always. Anyway, but here, when they receive instruction that this is the way to be, they will just follow. So even if it is, it is unethical, they have to do it. Every year we have to apply for license, publication license. And uh, we apply something like around September or October, and we wait. We will get the license somewhere 23rd of December. You know, so by the time usually beginning of December we should get our license. But if the beginning of December we we still don't have our license, you know, we are quite uh, uh, yes, quite takut lah. You know. And we behave. <coughs> we behave to ensure that we get our license by the 23rd. But sometimes we don't get the license until the 28th. And sometimes, sometimes we do not get the license until 5th of January. And we, but we still publish, but at a great risk. You see, because we are publishing illegally. And then of course on the 6th we get our license. You see, so, so, so how? How can we have an ethical newspaper? But fine. What happened now? I mean, following March 8, what what should be legislated is that maybe newspapers should not be owned by political parties. Newspapers, newspapers should not be owned by political or 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 owned by interests close to political parties. I think if we do that, maybe there is a chance, even with the existence. Of the 2030 laws, we may be. Okay. I think we are willing, and willing, some of us are willing to break unethical laws if we can get away with it. Uh, I mean, and that's very real because you need to survive, and you need to survive for the long term if you want to continue doing good journalism in Malaysia. Underlying that kind of statements that are made by politicians and people in government is that journalists don't live in Malaysia and we're not Malaysians and we're just out to create trouble. I think that whenever we, uh, whenever we are confronted with, say, a clash between uh, different ethnic communities, we do sit down in the newsroom and process that kind of information and say, how do we report this in as responsible a manner as possible so that we don't add fuel to the fire? Yeah, um, and so that happens, and that happens because we're Malaysians, we live in the same country where these things are happening, you know. And I wouldn't want to see race riots break out of my house, for example, because I have property in Malaysia, I have a car, you know, I have family, you know, why would I want to add fuel to a fire that creates unnecessary tension for me and all my family and friends, right? Uh, so that's the first assumption that we need to really look at when politicians make these kinds of um, statements.
statements about you know needing to control the media. Then the other thing is that like, we can be ethical in reporting difficult issues. I, I also don't like to use the word sensitive. It's difficult because a lot of it is personal, you know, in terms of religion and race. But there are ethical ways of dealing, and that's why we come back to ethical considerations. It's about being fair, it's about being non-discriminatory, it's about being respectful, you know. So these are actually basic guidelines in journalism. So there's really no need to fear about the, the, the backlash because there are actually good standards to put out a note to think that uh, actually also what Patron had said about this pakatan, uh, you and I pakat so that we can do it. So if all the media did something, it's very difficult for the government to take action. But it's also a question of how much solidarity we can actually build in the media fraternity because that's 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 always my question. If all the newspapers and the different you know stations stood together and said, we are going to do this, what are you going to do to us? I mean, maybe not so confrontational like that, but you know, that's a, a question to think about in terms of solidarity. And that's where I think we can provide support, uh, maybe to bring some of these uh, different groups to, to build solidarity. If you ask any journalist, you know, what, what, what ethics? They won't know what, what code of ethics we are talking about. You see? But the point is that why? It is important that this code of ethics, the, 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 the code, uh, the, the ethics, I mean, they are followed, they are adhered to. It's very important. I mean, <clears throat> we were talking at the time, at one time, of setting up a press council. A press council is to police, not police actually, is to ensure that newspapers abide by the code of ethics. You see? And then it is to be made up, the council is to be made up of the editors of the newspapers, of all the newspapers, and to be checked by a judge or an ex-judge. So, so much so that they study the newspapers every day and one office, officer from the council will call up the paper and say that, oh look, you have violated this code number one or code number two. So there is actually a little policy, you know. And uh, we suggested this to the Deputy Prime Minister, Abdullah Badawi, when he was Deputy Prime Minister, that we are prepared to set up this code of ethics. But, as a quid pro quo, you remove the Publication and Printing Presses Act because the editors will not accept a press council because they think this is another layer of control. So we told the Prime Minister this, uh, the Deputy Prime Minister then about this, and he said, "Okay, we we'll look into it, but until today, uh, nothing has happened." Okay. Uh, with regards to um, you know how there is a lack of courage uh, amongst uh, editors, I agree with you uh, that there is definitely uh, a few editors out there who are more compliant than they are resistant. Um, there is a reason I left the Star after 10 years, it was because it had developed this culture of compliance uh, and they had forgotten how, what it meant to, be, to resist. Uh, and I think resistance can come in different forms. I mean, the reality is that we will get shut down if we continue to, to defy government directives. That's the reality of it. And the long-term battle is how do you stay alive? How do you keep going day to day so that if you can't fight this battle anymore today, how do you stay alive so that you can fight the next battle tomorrow? Uh, and that's the kind of like thinking that happens within newsrooms. Yeah? I, I have no answer to how do we bring about a more courageous, a more critical thinking mass of journalists and editors. I think that's something that um, everybody needs to contribute to in some way or other. Um, I don't think it's just the role of media organizations to give birth to this kind of critical thinking or, or critical thinking or writing. I think that uh, news environments can create a good environment for that to happen, but I don't think we are the only place where it begins or it, or it ends. We have been celebrating, shall we say celebrating, Lamenting or whatever it is on May 3rd. May 3rd is World Press Freedom Day. Are we celebrating World Press Freedom Day or are we merely yearning for something which we don't have? Boring. You know? And, and this, this gathering is probably a gathering of people who are yearning for press freedom. Romantic yearning, maybe. So, in, so because of that, I think it is time that, as Gayatri said, we do something proactive. Otherwise, we will remain. Forever, Giannis. Will not be televised. The revolution will be no rerun, brothers. The revolution will be live.